everyone. Um, good morning if you're joining us on a Tuesday morning, uh, but perhaps it's good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from or when you're coming back and watching this. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I am with The Novel Neighbor, and we are so excited to celebrate um, and do Tuesday in such a fun and interesting way um, because we don't always get to do Tuesday story times. We used to do these all the time, um, and so I love when we get to start Tuesday with a story time. Um, because what better way? Um, and but what I mean by fun is interesting is that not only are we reading an interesting story, but we have an author present with us this morning, which is a way better way to read a story, in my opinion, because they know the story better than any of us ever could. Um, so thank you so much for bearing with us. I know we're a little late getting on. We had technical difficulties, which is like, what is a virtual event in a Tuesday morning without technical difficulties? Relatable, am I right? Um, well, my name again is Stephanie. I'm with The Novel Neighbor. We're a locally owned and independently operated bookstore in St. Louis, Missouri. And we have someone hailing with us this morning all the way from Washington, D.C. Um, that's right. We have Susan Cusell, who is a synagogue librarian and children's book buyer for an independent bookstore. She has served as a member of the Caldecott Medal Selection Committee in the chair of the Sydney Taylor Med of the Sydney Taylor Book Award Committee. The Passover Guest is her first picture book, and she lives in Arlington, Virginia. And I just want to show you. You're going to see this up close and personal in just a second. But oh my gosh, I am so excited about this book. It's got a shiny medal on it that I hope Susan will tell us about later. So without any further ado, let me invite Susan on. Hi, Susan. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, I am a book buyer for an independent bookstore. And so indies are, I've been working in indies for over 15 years and that's uh, what I love. And so it means a great deal to me to uh, be, be with you today at such a wonderful indie and uh, joining you in St. Louis or wherever you may be watching this from. Yes, thank you so much, Susan. I'm so excited. I know we have so much love for this book. This book is receiving a lot of love. Um, so congratulations on that. That has to be super exciting. It is. You know, when you've been in the industry so long, it's, uh, you know, it was wild to, you know, to use a little indie, a little industry terminology, you know, to see the book in Edelweiss and to, um, which is where we all buy books from and to uh, to get reviews of it. And um, as Stephanie mentioned, it, it does have a medal on the cover, which is feels miraculous to me. It's the Sydney Taylor Book Award, which I was on the committee and the chair of uh, all together for six years. So to be recognized by your own peers, by the Association of Jewish Libraries, which I'm an active member of, was a enormous thing. And uh, uh, really quite something to hear my name at the um, American Library Association press conference this uh, January with the Newbury and the Caldecott. You know, that was that was something else. So, oh, congratulations. That has to be so exciting. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I think our plan for the day is first you're going to read the book to us, um, but then you're going to give us a little bit of like behind the scenes, a little bit in Q of Q&A. So if some of our um, young listeners and adult listeners have any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. We are getting those in real time. Um, so I guess you need me to sh um, pull up the book, right? Are we ready? Yeah, we, we as Stephanie mentioned, we had a little uh, technical difficulties as as one must uh, to do to do an event these days. Um, so Stephanie's going to share my my PowerPoint and uh, go through it. Um, so this is the Passover Guest, um, written by me, and it's um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see see the cover here, um, and it uh, it's illustrated by the very talented Sean Rubin, um, and published by Holiday House Books and. Uh, the editor and also the imprint is Neil Porter, Neil Porter Books, uh, who's just the greatest editor ever. And uh, so the next slide is the um, is the book jacket, and I love I love the way the book jacket is. And then, um, uh, which is yeah, which is this. And then after that, yeah, I don't know if it's is it is it playing through on the slideshow. <laughs> I always have this trouble when I'm running it, so. <laughs> I think 
Yeah. Okay. That is playing it. Okay. I can't see myself. So <laughs> okay. if you go back one, uh, two slides. Okay. Let me... I think if you play the slideshow, it might be easier. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Okay. So this is the case cover. Which so if you if you take the jacket off, um, you see underneath the uh, the cover, which is a Passover Seder, and the illustrator just did an extraordinary job on the Seder. Um, really made you feel like you were there. And then uh, if you go to the next slide, sorry, I know this is awkward. <laughs> All right, uh, one more. Okay, did it did it go? Is oh. it not going? No, it's it's skipping lots of slides. Um, <laughs> what side did it not go? Here, did it go? Perfect. Yeah, that one. Okay. There must be a delay. I'm trying to figure that out. Yeah. Um, okay. I can I can tell you the numbers if that's easier. Yeah. Can you see the numbers? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Okay, so slide number four. Okay, here we are. We're going to make it work. Okay, we're determined. <laughs> so this is um, this is the the what we call the end papers, um, which are inside. Sorry, it, it, this uh, this mirrors you. So I'm going. I keep going to the wrong side. I apologize. Um, if you're still listening with us after all these technical issues, then. Um, I'm delighted to have you here. Um, so these are the end papers, uh, which are glued down. They're at the end. And um, if you know Washington, D.C., which I know very well because I uh, grew up in D.C., I lived there all my life. And one of the things I really wanted to represent in D.C. was the cherry blossoms. They're very famous. They're iconic in Washington. They were a gift from the government of Japan in 1912. And um, if you go to slide five, uh, you'll see there... They're, they're all around the uh, tidal basin. And uh, that is a, uh, this also iconic uh, body of water. That's where you see the cherry blossoms. And in DC every spring, we get up to a million people who come to see the cherry blossoms. It's a very big part of that. And so that of DC in the spring, and I wanted to showcase that in a book about spring in DC. Okay, so if you go to slide five and then slide six. <laughs> Sorry. Is it not updating with them? No, oh, no, it's only too radical. Okay, we'll start here. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have been I have been updating them. I don't know why. It's showing me on my screen. So I will just keep okay. it in the view because it seems to update it better and I'll just make some. Okay, more. awesome. Okay, so this is the beginning of the book. Um, Muriel loved Washington in the springtime. The white buildings stood out crisply against the crisp lawns, <laughs> sorry, against the green lawns. The cherry trees burst into pink blossom at the tidal basin. She could feel Passover in the air. Okay, ne next slide. Perfect. Hooray. Um, the year 1933 was different. Her father, like so many others, had lost his job. Her family didn't have enough to eat even on ordinary days. It would be impossible to buy all the food needed for their Passover Seder. They didn't have enough wine even to fill the ceremonial cup for the prophet Elijah, who was said to visit every Passover Seder. Okay. <laughs> So there was no need to rush home to prepare the holiday feast. Muriel walked slowly from the park and stopped to look up at Lincoln on his magnificent marble chair. A strange figure dressed in rags, juggling on the steps of the monument, caught her eye. He looked as threadbare as the men on the street waiting in line for soup. As she watched, his brown hair turned red. The eggs he juggled became blazing candles. His shabby clothes turned into those of the finest silk. Muriel was amazed. She took her only penny and put it in the hat at the man's feet. He smiled at her. The sun is setting. Passover is about to start. You don't want to miss your Seder. My family isn't having one this year, Muriel answered. Are you sure? asked the man. Perhaps you'd better hurry home. 
He sounded so confident that Muriel started walking quicker than she ever had before. She ignored the Washington Monument gleaming in the fading sunlight. She rushed past the White House without a second glance. Gradually, the stately buildings began to recede. When she got to her neighborhood, her stomach grumbled as she smelled the delicious food from other satyrs. The celebrations were smaller this year, but she could still see tables filled with food and windows shining with light. What could the man have meant? How could they have a feast without any food? Her feet went faster and faster. When she arrived home, she opened the door in anticipation, but she saw only the same shabby room with the spindly chairs and rickety table that had always been there. Her parents emerged from the shadows, dressed in their best clothes for the holiday, even though there was no food on the table, no gleaming silverware, no wine set aside for Elijah. Every door will be open to us on Passover, said her father. Let us find another home where we can celebrate. As Muriel reached for the door handle, there was a knock. When she opened it, she saw the mysterious stranger standing there. May I join your Seder, he asked. You are welcome to share anything we have, answered Muriel's father. But this year, we have nothing. I have everything we need, said the man. Muriel turned and looked again at the room. It was no longer shabby, but glowing with light from countless candles. The chairs were piled with comfortable pillows and the food. There were mountains of tender brisket, oceans of flavorful soup, and fields of crunchy matzah. A magnificent Seder plate lay in the center of the table, complete with an egg, a shank bone, horseradish, parsley, lettuce, and harbozi. There was even a beautiful cup of wine for Elijah. Muriel hadn't realized she was hungry, but now she wanted to eat everything, even the horseradish. Muriel and her parents couldn't believe their eyes. After seeing so little food for so long, their house was now bursting with it. Can this really be, her mother asked. How is this possible, her father asked. He sounded nervous. Everything is possible on Passover, answered the man. Muriel could tell her parents were uneasy. She volunteered to ask the rabbi if they could proceed with this astonishing meal. She ran to the synagogue and found the rabbi about to start his own Seder. She told him about their mysterious guest and how a magnificent feast had appeared from nowhere. If you can pour the wine and break the matzah, then what you have described is a true miracle, said the rabbi. Can you show me your Seder? Muriel led the way, and the rabbi's curious guests followed. More people joined the procession as it passed other Seders. When they reached Muriel's house, the crowd was enormous, but the stranger was no longer there. There. Everyone crowded into the tiny house. They all managed to fit inside as the rabbi examined the table. They watched as the wine poured itself, and then the middle matzah broke in two and became the avakoman the children would look for later. The rabbi picked up a piece of matzah, crumbled it in his hand, and then blessed the meal. This is not an illusion, he said, but a Passover miracle. We may all enjoy this beautiful feast. There were enough chairs for all, their own satyrs forgotten. The guests joined Muriel's family in their retelling of the story of Passover. They dipped their parsley in salt water and ate bitter herbs. Muriel asked the four questions about Passover. All the children searched for the piece of hidden matzah, which was found just before midnight. Muriel realized that in all the excitement, they had forgotten to open the door for a life. But when she looked at his cup, there was not a drop of wine in it. Now she knew who the mysterious stranger was. And these are some more, these are some notes about uh, some research I did and the author did. And then this is uh, some information about Passover and a picture of Washington there. And the back end papers with the cat facing um, the other direction. 
than in the firm. And then, okay, so this is, um, these are, this was the page we didn't see in the beginning, but we're going to see it now. This is the title page and this is the title basin. And um, we decided uh, this story is based on a story by a very famous Yiddish author. He's actually called the father of Yiddish literature. Yiddish is a combination of Yiddish and Hebrew um, and uh this author, Ayal Peretz. And so it was based on a short story written over a hundred years ago called the Kunstermacher, uh, which is the magic maker, usually translated as the magician. And um, I'm, I love this story. I first saw it um, in, a, in, a, in a different version, in a, in a picture book version. And I made a lot of changes to this story. And the most two significant changes I made, it was originally, originally set, you know, a hundred years ago in Poland, and I brought it forward to uh, the Great Depression and to Washington, D.C. So those are the, and also there was no child in the story, so that was a very <coughs> significant change. But you see here the Great Depression, and if you go to the next slide, Yeah, so this is uh, Washington, D.C. at the time in the 1930s. And this is the Lincoln Memorial, which was a big uh, spot that I used in this book. And these are the cherry blossoms at the time in the 1930s. Um, I, although the book you know, has, a, has a fantasy element and is fiction, um, I'm a librarian is one of my many jobs and I wanted the book to be as accurate as possible where it could be. So that means like when if you see a picture today of the cherry blossom, they will all include not this Lincoln Memorial, but they'll all include Jefferson Memorial. That's the memorial on the title basin that I mentioned. My book does not include the Jefferson Memorial because it was not built in 1933. It was built later. So that was very important to get those kind of details accurate. Um, okay, if we go to the next one. Um, the Depression, the Great Depression was um, 1930, you know, 1929, most of the 1930s. And when we, and people didn't have enough food or places to live or enough money. And when we talk about it, we often talk about certain places being affected, and, and we don't usually talk about the nation's capital being, um, being one of those places. So if you go to the next slide, sorry to make you do this. No, no. <laughs> um, if you look in the background of both these real pictures that I found, they look very much like the Depression. But in the background, the U.S. Capitol is in both. So these are actually pictures of Washington, D.C., not New York or somewhere else during the Depression. And so we wanted to show that. And I found a lot of fascinating pictures. Um, this is one. This is a picture um, that I wanted to show. You know, if you if we went through the book just now and they just look like you know, pictures that all came out of the artist's head. And they did. And the artist Sean Rubin is incredibly talented. But he also had, uh, he based it on something. So there's a famous artist, uh, the most famous Jewish artist probably. His name is Mark Chagall. And so Sean kind of did an homage uh, to Chagall. And this picture demonstrates that very clearly. So look at the picture, how this the position of the man, the background is this yellow color. And if you go to the next slide, so this is the book, picture in the final book. These are early versions that Sean drew of that moment of, you know, him juggling. And um, on the left hand, you know, his clothes are very different. The right side picture, he's starting to get that look of the, the juggler bent over, right? And in that, and go to the next slide, and that really shows us. So that upper left picture, that is a, a real picture by Mark Chagall. 
And that's where he got the yellow, the black clothing, the, the, the shape of his body. And you can see in this sketch, more than a sketch here, this early work uh, that Sean did on the lower right, it's different, right? Sean brought his own character to it, but it was a homage. It was a reference to Chagall because he wanted to reference Chagall all through his work. And the same thing true with this one. So this, this is a different kind of reference. So here, um, we, we wanted the book, the Jews who were living at the time uh, in Washington, D.C. were white Ashkenazi Jews. And that's who was there at the time, realistically, historically. But we didn't want the book to be all that. So we, so we did research and we, we if, you, if you, you might not have noticed, but in earlier scenes, um, I had found a, uh, uh, what we call Hoover Town, which was one of those places where people um, didn't have a lot of money and they lived in those poor little houses that we saw earlier on, that there were people who were black and white living together. Well, that was, I actually found one that was in DC at that time that was desegregated, even though DC was the South. So we we're able to find that realistically and so here, I found a picture of a, of a black man crossing the street, the street that was on this trip in 1933 in the Library of Congress and all that. So we, we incorporate, so this guy is not a token. He was really there at that time. This guy you see with the lunchbox. Now, that's the picture here on the left. On the, on the right is a very famous Marc Chagall picture called Eye in the Village. And if you look at it, um, Sean took the color palette. He took the colors and he put it. So if you go back one slide, you can see the colors of Eye in the Village are here with this research I did with this guy and what he looked like. And then that combined to make this picture. Okay. Um, I did really crazy level of research on um, main character Muriel takes this four mile walk. It doesn't look like it in the book, but it is four miles and I walked it many, many times between the Lincoln Memorial and this uh, synagogue you see, the Sixth and I synagogue where the Jewish community was living at the time. And um, I was obsessive to find which buildings were there in on April 10th, 1933, which which were actually existing. And um, and so I had this spreadsheet, I had many spreadsheets for this book, but one of the spreadsheets, crazy number of spreadsheets, um, but one of the spreadsheets was um, what buildings, you know, existed, what buildings no longer existed, you know, that, that were red herrings and what buildings uh, were under construction. And one of the buildings that was under construction at this time was the National Archives, where we, where there's a lot of, um, you know, research and data, and it's where the, you know, we collect all these things, the National Archives. And if you see in the back of this picture, the National Archives are in fact under construction because they were then. And the illustrator really liked the idea of having, showing there's only like a couple years in time where the archives were under construction. And he wanted to show us that. So if you go to the next slide, this is the National Archives under construction. And we found this picture in the National Archives because that's where they keep these things. Um, it's very, so usually people have this image of a illustrator and an art and an author sitting down having coffee and talking about everything and you want to put this in no how about that let's change that let's make it a pig no horse that doesn't happen at all um in fact people you will they'll never talk they'll if they talk they'll be very formal or they'll talk after the book is done or they'll talk after they've done a few books together i had a very unusual experience on this book where I talked to the illustrator all the way through. And that was great uh, and lucky. But we never talked about real things. We, we talked a lot more about like what food was going to be on the table. We never talked about big stuff. And if it was ever a big thing, it always went through the editor. It never, 
and now we talk every day, but um, the big stuff always in through editor. But the thing that I got lucky enough to do that I would never have done otherwise is very early on while we were talking, um, I said, hey, you know, this, this book's all about food and dishes. Can you use my dishes? And he said, send them to me. And I took a picture of every dish I possessed, every fancy dish, every formal dish. And you'll see my dishes ended up in the book. Uh, this was another research thing um, where, again, we're trying to get it. Again, it looks, you know, Sean is a, um, is a graphic novelist. He's a cartoonist. So, you know, it looks a little silly and a little bit, but it's also very accurate. Right. So like he said, uh, so these are awnings that were on the White House in the 1930s because they didn't have air conditioning and the Truman balcony, uh, which is there now, wasn't there. Um, and so so the awnings help circulate air. This is a picture on the left of Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the first lady at the time in front of her. I love this brand new car. And uh and so you see the awnings there on the right, which were real. And also on the right, this was a picture I found because Sean needed a 1933 White House, not DC cop, a White House policeman. And so this is an exact copy of a picture I found um, of a White House policeman at that time. Um, the next picture is uh, Sixth and I, which is a huge Jewish landmark synagogue in DC. And I know it doesn't mean much in St. Louis, but in Washington, um, every DC Jewish person who has opened this book has gone, oh my gosh, sixth and I, you put in sixth and I. So, it, so that's what it means. And um, to me, it's, it's just so cool. Up there, you see that the rabbi is using my dishes. So apparently, my dishes were sold all over town, and I think that's pretty cool. So, <laughs> um, this is the real synagogue, six and I. And you can see this stained glass window. Sean's drawing was so accurate that we have been able to hold it up to that stained glass window. Do you see on the right? And it matches the window because he drew proportionally so exactly. Um, that's awesome. Is that not awesome? It's it's the coolest thing. We've done it three times now, and these pictures are impossible to take because you've got to... <laughs> um, and every time that people on the street are like, what are you doing? But they're really cool. Um, <laughs> we have three pictures of this. This is the Lincoln Memorial, um, which, which you may have seen, or, you know, the Lincoln Memorial is super famous. Uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech was at the Lincoln Memorial. Whenever anyone wants to give a big speech or have a big rally, it's here. Um, the Washington DC is laid out. It's like this, it has what we call the National Mall. It's not shopping, but it's this big rectangle. And at one end is the, sorry, okay. <laughs> one end is the Capitol, the US Capitol building where Congress meets. And at the other end is the Lincoln Memorial. And, um, it, originally, this book was set in this tiny little town and the magician juggles in the town square. And when I decided to set in D.C. and I was talking to my editor and where should we put the juggler? And I said, it has to be the Lincoln Memorial. And um, he's not from D.C. and he had actually never been there. And I took him there and I actually made him walk all those four miles. And I also made the illustrator walk the four miles, too. You, you apparently don't want to visit me in DC. And um, and as we were standing at the Lincoln Memorial, and I said, look, Neil, this is DC's town square. There's always something happening and always people going and coming and action and this is it. And he looked at me, he said, no, it's the nation's town square. And, um, and I believe that uh, the two little kids you see there in the front, the cute little kids are, are the illustrator's kids. And um, every, this is such a famous place. Um, uh, I've seen it illustrated so many times and I just love the way Sean illustrated it here. I think he made it perfect and beautiful. It's a very hard thing to illustrate and I love how he did it. 
So um, don't worry, I'm almost up. But, um, the uh, it's funny, you know. I talked about not collaborating, right? You don't usually collaborate, and this is an example of not collaborating. So the illustrator and I didn't ever talk about this until I saw it. And he did this thing without me. Like he came up with his own ideas. And I think you have to let the illustrator do that. You know, a lot of writers like write all these art notes, you know, the illustrator must do this and they must do that. But I don't write art notes because I believe in the illustrator coming up with it on their own. And this is an example of that. So um, there's a part in the book where Muriel puts a penny in the hat. Uh, in the, and that's not in the original at all. And I had her put a penny in the hat because it was the depression. She didn't have any money. And in that moment, when she puts the penny in the hat, uh, the whole book changes, right? Then, uh, big spoiler alert, that was Elijah, who was a juggler. And uh, Elijah realizes, you know, now he's going to come. So she puts the penny in the hat, and then he comes to make the magical Seder. So, but I only had to put the penny in the hat because a penny is less than a nickel or a dime because, you know, it's not very much money. And I had, I used the Lincoln Memorial because of the reason I just told you, because to me, the Lincoln Memorial is, is that's it. That's the place in Washington that I wanted. And, um, but Sean uh, was way more intelligent than me and said, you know, Lincoln's on the penny. And I was like, oh, um, and he, he also said, you know, there's a certain type time of day where the, pen, the, the Lincoln Memorial, the way the sun comes into the Lincoln Memorial, it looks, the Lincoln Memorial looks copper colored and copper is the color of the penny. You see this picture, it's taken by Pete Souza, who was the photographer, uh, Barack Obama's photographer. The two little people you see in that picture are Michelle and Barack Obama. That's why there's nobody standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Let me tell you, that never happens, ever. You'd have to have the Secret Service clear them because that's not a realistic look. Um, there's like hundreds of people in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, but... Uh, so he made this scene on the right copper color to match the penny. And that was all something he brought to it. And then he returned the penny at the end. He has the magician return the penny uh, because he doesn't need it, but she does. Uh, so Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we don't directly mention him, but he, so the inauguration right now, it's in January, right? Uh, we, we inaugurate the president January 20th. But at this time in history, the inauguration was in March. Um, and uh, Roosevelt, FDR, got inaugurated in March. This book is set in April 10th, 1933. He was inaugurated in March 1933. He was president less than a month. It was his first inauguration. And the, this book is all about going from darkness to light, going from hopelessness to hope. Roosevelt, FDR, was the hope. All my proposals for this book, I was writing about FDR and saying how he, he was the hope. 1933, that was the, the tipping point. That was where we were starting to come out of the depression. And it was because of Roosevelt. FDR brought us out. So um, these statues then the next one you're going to see uh, is they're from the, oh, you can go back. Hang on. <laughs> um, I skipped ahead. Um, they're from the FDR Memorial, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial. And they are on uh, right at the tidal base, right at the cherry blossoms, right where all this is set. So this is based on a couple and you can see it. Now you can go to the next slide. And this is the bread line. This is probably the more famous statue. They're actually right next to each other. And you can see how both these statues, just like the Chagall one I was showing you, um, it's an homage. It's a reference. He made it his own. There, you know, you probably wouldn't even notice that these are based on, but it's a it's showing you this is this is a reference to FDR. And then here's the last uh, thing here, which is. Um, this is Sean, the back of Sean, <laughs> the illustrator, and we all 
me and my husband and Sean's wife all made him stand this way and we got the hat on his hip just right. Um, this is in front of the uh, house that he based this uh, Muriel's house on. So you can, in fact, it's, this is the model of the cover. And um, there's a line in the book that said she forgot to open the door for Elijah. In fact, she did open the door for Elijah. She did it right here. And um, Passover, the idea of Passover is that you welcome all who are hungry to come and eat. All may have a seat at a table. We always have room for everybody. And that's what this cover is. Everyone is welcome. And that is the, the idea of the book for me. And uh, if you have any questions after that, I am delighted to answer them. Let me... Hi. Okay. We did it, Susan. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much. Everybody. It's a miracle that we did it. Uh, it really is. You know, <laughs> I'm everyone for watching. Um, we did have a question that we collected from one of our young readers this weekend that we wanted to make sure that we get to. Um, and they were just asking, um, and I think it actually makes even more sense after hearing, you know, that you've been involved in the book world for quite some time as a librarian, as a book buyer. Um, also, shout out to PJ Library. Hey, PJ yeah. Library. Wait, wait, wait. Let me let me just uh, thank PJ Library. Yeah. Um, PJ Library put this book out. I am deeply grateful. They have been a huge, huge supporter. Um, I have, uh, you know, known them and many people in PJ Library for many, many years, and uh, they have supported my my new writing as well. And uh, really grateful to PJ Library for everything they've done. Yes. Well, and we were a little um, beside ourselves at the beginning. <laughs> we would have shouted them out sooner, but PJ Library and the Jewish Federation of St. Louis have been incredible to work with um, for this. So, And we're really excited about some future stuff that we're going to um, get in store as well. So, um, yeah, um, we are. So yeah, you had a question. Yeah, we have our youngest reader. Yeah. Um, uh, our young, one of our young readers was asking, um, what made, like, I think I'm turning this into a two-part question. Their question was, what advice do you have for, um, for our young friends who are thinking about maybe um, writing and or I'm adding in illustrating might be something that they're interested in doing in the future? And then I'll come back and ask you the second part. Okay, so I get this question a lot when I do school visits. This is probably the most frequently asked question. And um, my answer is always to not stop and not give up. And so usually, you know, um, when you talk to like a younger class, you know, everybody is writing, everybody is drawing, everybody is painting. But when you talk to adults, they're not, right? They gave up. And so I hope that you keep going. Um, this book that I... Uh, just talked about took 10 years and um, and there were a lot of places to have given up and and I am very lucky that I didn't and in fact there was a moment in which I remember was talking to my editor and he hadn't selected the he hadn't decided to do the book yet and um, and I said you know is it just time is it enough I'm going to give up and he said no don't give up um, there's something here and, and, you know, and I'm grateful that I didn't. And I think five years later, it finally was a book. <laughs> um, so I think, I think just maybe a year after that, he said, yes. So, um, but yeah, I watch people all the time, um, you know, have success, you know, at so many different times when you didn't think so, you know, like they, they tried, and this is to any adults listening as well, you know, people who, you know, they tried 300 agents and the 300 verse said, yes, they, they tried 10 books and the 11th book worked out, you know, to not give up and, um, and to kids, um, to just keep doing what you love. There, there's no reason to stop. Um, you know, everybody is a writer. Everybody is an illustrator. Um, we shouldn't stop. I love that. Well, and you, you kind of answered one of my questions that I had for you, which was how long did this take? And you said 10 years. And kind of what I was also going to wrap into that is 
what made you, was it always this story or like what made you want to write this in the first place? And maybe it evolved from where you originally were 10 years ago. I don't know how much the storyline stayed um, kind of along those lines, but like what made you want to write a children's book? I mean, any children's book or this particular one? This one. This one, this yeah. one, which is now like a book and you have a copy where you are. Oh my gosh. Like it's, it's so hard to believe. I mean, I just, I was driving to work this morning and I had a copy with me um, cause I was doing this event and I, so I had a copy on the seat and I was like, Whoa, it's just still a book. It's really a book, like a real thing. And you know, and it's been really wild because um, this is the second the book's second Passover and uh, and it's like it's second Super Bowl. Um, you know, it's a very Passover is a very big deal for this book. And um, and it's just to see so many people like libraries and bookstores and to just, you know, still be interested. In it, it's been wild. Um, so this particular book, um, I sort of started saying um, my mom read me uh this version by Yuri Shelovitz, who's this, you know, very famous Caldecott winning author. Um, he did a version of the picture book version of The Magician and um, in the 70s. And I, my mom read it to me and I loved it. I thought it was so cool. It's very different. And um, it's, it, it follows the Yiddish story, uh, the parrot story. Uh, Shelovitz uh, speaks Yiddish and he translated it. And, uh, and then 20 or more years later, I found it in a Jewish library and I was just um, taken by it again. And I just remember sinking down the floor and going, oh, my gosh, book. I love this book. And then um, a few years later, I had some time to do some writing and I was like, this book, I love it. And I was like, but you know what? I don't like this and I don't like this. And what if I change that? And what if I change this and this and this and this and this? And there became like 10 things that I wanted to mess with. And the book is in the public domain. And I, uh, I started messing with it. And then when, so I wrote it for about four years, I think. And then when my editor got involved, we got these, I remember sitting down in his office the first time and saying, and he said, where and when? And the first meeting, and then that creamed it off into the that that those two big points: the, the DC and uh, the depression. I love that. I've really enjoyed, and I know everyone else has, getting all of this background. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's so great to hear all the research that goes into it because sometimes I think that there can be a misconception that writing a children's picture book is um, an easy feat. Um, and it well, certainly I think, not. I think we should preface that by saying that I'm insane. <laughs> um, and and then not everybody is a librarian. And, and my editor frequently said, enough, Dianu. Um, like, and he's saying it now, we're talking, you know, we don't, we, you know, nothing formal, but we're, you know, shooting back and forth about another project. And he's like, stop. I mean, so, I, so the, the example that I give, and this, cause this is not, other people don't do what I just described. Um, but the example that I always give is, um, the enough, when I knew it was enough was, uh, we were looking at close to final art. And um, <laughs> we were looking at, um, so you showed me the first page. I'm gonna do it the wrong way. Okay, what's the first page, right? There, okay. And there were people wearing overcoats on this page. Uh-huh. It's 1933. The book is set on April 10th, 1933. And I said, this is the first page I saw. I sat down as I was first page and I said, they can't wear overcoats. And he said, what? Like the, the book was like, do, and it, it needed to be printed. And he, I said, they can't wear overcoats. And he said, why not? And uh, I said, because the weather that report that day was in the late, in the high seventies. And he looked at me Anyway, they're wearing overcoats. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Okay. 
So they're wearing overcoats. I, what I did not know is that they're wearing overcoats in every scene. Um, and that the book was like needed to be printed three days ago. Um, anyway, that was where I realized it was enough and that I was the only person who cared about a weather report from 90 years ago. <laughs> Sometimes you have to let it go. But you know, favorite factoid now to know. I love that. You know, well, I had been on the Caldecott committee, and it's harder when you have been in the room, and then you you try to turn that part of your brain off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that was when I knew um, you can go too far. So. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, I think it's been incredibly insightful to hear all of this, to be able to make a lot of these references. Um, it really makes you, uh, I've already read the picture book and then I was getting to see it through fresh eyes, which is why it's so wonderful when we get to have authors visit. What is that? Is that our this is my friend made me. Oh my gosh. And then uh, my, so the, so interestingly enough, um, I named the main character Muriel, who's my grandmother. And so it was a tribute to my grandmother. And Sean, the illustrator, put this hat on her head, one, so you could follow through the book, mm -hmm. but also because the hat belonged to his great, great aunt. And that. his mother had made this hat for his uh, great, great aunt. But then we went to a book event recently, and his mother made me this hat. I love that. So that little, is little show and tell. Yes. I'd be able to do in person, but uh, maybe not in St. Louis. Yeah. Maybe next Passover. <laughs> we, can, we can do something in person. I've never been to St. Louis. Oh my gosh. You have to come. We are have you ever been to DC. Oh yes. I actually went to George Mason university. So oh, my I, daughter is starting at George Mason uh, this year. Oh my God, it's smart. Yeah, she, she just accepted. That is so exciting. Yes, I went there. So I love DC. I know there's a lot of St. Louisans who also love DC. Um, <laughs> have to host you in St. Louis. We're an incredible city. And, and uh, you like George Mason? Huh? You like George Mason? I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. Um, it was incredible. I. Now that everybody's listening to this conversation. <laughs> I know. I'd be happy to talk to your daughter if she wants to know anything about George Mason. Um, that's actually, I go back every year because of it. Um, ah, so well, you have to come visit. Yes, that would be incredible. I'll show you the Lincoln Memorial. Perfect. Again, it won't be quite as um, cleared out as the picture you showed us of. Um, I know. That's craziness. I have never, I can't, I'm like, like at three in the morning, it doesn't look like that. That's nuts. It is nuts. Um, yeah. You there can't, is. you cannot achieve that without the Secret Service. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, well, thank you so much. I know that you are in your synagogue, um, hiding perhaps in a room um, just to present to us. So we really appreciate you joining us on a Tuesday morning. I can't think of a more fun way. We have so many copies in our store um, that we would love to sell everybody. So everyone watching, please feel free to stop by. Um, I, I can send you book plates too. Yes. Oh my gosh. That'd be amazing. Um, PJ Library and the St. Louis, um, to the Jewish Federation of St. Louis um, have been wonderful in our offering, um, helping us be able to offer a discount on these. So oh. details, if you go visit our website, which has information about our event this morning, um, if you want to hear more about that. And again, that's just through um, PJ Library. It's just so wonderful. Um, as and, you're, and, you, and, Jewish, and the Jewish Federation is wonderful. So, yes. um, you know, as, as a synagogue librarian, I, uh, you know, have worked with, both groups so, so much and, uh, you know, really am impressed with them all uh, over and over and over again. So yeah. I'm so glad that you have wonderful ones uh, where you are. Yes, we are so happy that we have such amazing, I, I get, like you said, the national kind of chapters. Well, right. There's the chapters in particular are very dear to my heart. St. Louis, uh, St. Louis chapters are just incredible. They've been amazing community partners. We're so thankful for them. Um, so... Thank you so much, everyone, for watching and bearing with us as we got through some of those snafus at the beginning. We really appreciate it. The beginning, in the middle, and the end. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, Susan, thank you so much. I'm sure that we will talk more. Um, and we will um, see everyone either in the store or when we're out in the community.
Oh yeah, I, I, I really hope you all um, come and support the Novel Neighbor. It sounds like just such a wonderful store and hopefully I get to visit one day. And uh, thank you all for having me. And um, I hope you have a wonderful spring holiday season. There are so many holidays happening at just all the same. Uh, so I hope, I hope your spring and your holidays are wonderful. Yes. Thank you, Susan. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. You do. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.